What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Dig It Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Walsh, and today we got Dr. Nick Serio of Velo U in the house. This is going to be a fun one. Coach Nick wears a lot of different hats, okay? He's a business owner. He's a doctor. He's a pitching coach. He's a mentor. He's a, he's a father. His son just graduated today, and he's here. Um, this is going to be a fun one. We're going to go a lot of different direction, guys. Even if you're not a pitching coach, uh, a pitcher or a pitching coach or whatever it may be, Coach Nick Serio has a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience in the game of baseball in the field of uh, exercise science. I'm excited to dive into this one. I don't. Me and Coach Nick have never met each other. We're both from New York, and we we know similar people, but I've never got to meet him. And so this is going to be fun, not only for you listeners, but for me as well to dive into the in between the ears of coach Nick Serio, owner of Velo U. Thank you so much for joining us. Please just give our listeners just a little bit of insight on where you were and how you got to where you're at today. Of course, first off, thanks for having me. Um, of course. Where I was and where I got there. Well, uh, normal like <laughs> high school baseball, right? Um, went on to uh, Division One school out of high school. Uh, class Our rival, eight. by the way, I went to LIU, oh. coach, so oh, there Sacred Heart, yes, 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 Bridgeport, <laughs> uh, beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah wink. Big, uh, <laughs> um, big ego coming out of high school, just like most kids that did really well in high school, right, and um, didn't play well for me in my first couple of years of college, uh, transferred over to Cortland thinking, hey, no problem, I'll play here, right? going D1 to D3, this is going to be easy, go up. And at that time, in case everybody's wondering, we're talking, you know, 2005, uh, everybody throws hard. Uh, Meaning when everybody throws hard, that's really only 88 to 92. Uh, That's (laughs) not that everybody throws hard. Now That used to be gas. Gas, gas was. And uh, so um, I show up to Cortland and everybody's throwing 90 plus. And I'm like, what is going on? Uh, so uh, it was a very humbling experience, a very eye-opening experience for me uh, that the world is a lot bigger than my little bubble. Uh, and especially because, listen, during that time, there's no iPhones yet. There's no Facebook. There's no Instagram. There's no any social media, right? So, so your ability to understand what's really out there in the world is so limited. And um, I think in today's world, that speaks to a lot of why You know, these younger generations get a lot of crap for, you know, not being mature enough or they're too, they're too pampered or they're too this or too that. I'll I'll be the first to tell you, uh, 90% of the guys that we have in our program are 10 times more mature than I ever was, uh, are way more dedicated and motivated towards what they need to accomplish, are aware of what they need to accomplish and work on. And it's so incredibly uh, refreshing to see uh, that these young athletes are not just willing, but want to take control over their career. Um, and it took me a while to learn how to do that myself. Um, so uh, got my undergrad in exercise science, my master's in kinesiology with a uh, minor in uh, performance psychology. That to me, when I was going through some of that education um, was eye opening. I was like, Oh, okay. Wow. This is, the missing link. This is the gap. Like, because you're training guys in a weight room, right? And the transferability of strength and conditioning is so difficult, right? And no matter how many ways we try and quantify, oh, that guy can produce X force on the force plate, or he can run X, Y, and Z in a 10 and this and that, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, it's not actually, it's very difficult to tell how did that transfer to the game, right? And uh, when I started realizing that, it was, it was almost discouraging um, because I felt like I could only help a very small portion of this athlete's career. Um, so I dove into performance psychology, ended up getting my doctorate in that. Um, the doctorate was one of the greatest experiences because of how different, for anybody that hasn't gone through that, a doctorate is than your master's and even your undergrad. It was way more critically thinking. It was way more exploratory, trying to discover problems and then conquer them or understand how other people are facing problems and help them conquer them. So uh, long and short, got to there. And then um, when I was, I actually was doing my doctorate when I was opening Athletes Warehouse, which is the parent company of Below You. Um, and 
during that time period, uh, COVID happened. And when COVID happened, our parent company, Athletes Warehouse, really didn't recover well out of COVID because not a lot of other athletes were playing. Uh, baseball was the only sport that was really, uh, how do you put it, like uh, low risk, right? So right. we found all baseball guys playing and we had had a baseball program before. I'd never uh, termed it Zelo U or anything like that, um, but had been working with a large population of baseball mm -hmm. guys. And out of that, we emerged uh, below you and just have really dove into it. And then um, just seeing this industry, this industry is amazing, right? Because it's, it, it tries to be so tech driven. Uh, it tries to be so forward thinking and, and adjusting to the populations of now, right? And ultimately, at the end of the day, it still dwindles all the way down to such a simple game with such simple rules and simple concepts that ultimately I think the biggest thing lost on most people is it's absolutely a team sport, but specifically a lot of the guys we work with being pitchers, we work with everybody. We work with a lot of catchers and a lot of position guys as well, but specifically pitchers, it's really a spotlight sport. You're on your own. And that was where uh, starting to realize that was where a lot of the mental side came in and, and, understanding that it can be either your, your greatest asset or your biggest limiting factor and, and most likely not anywhere in between. I love that coach. Let's um, there's a lot to unpack in that, in that intro, but let's, let's stay with the last thing you just said on it could either help you or hurt you in between the ears. And, you know, it, I, I think there's a lot of uncontrollables in life and, and baseball, right. And pitching and hitting whatever it may be, but you know, talk about some controllables there for youth athlete, a high school athlete within, in between the ears of competition. Yeah, so, so, mm -hmm. um, so I actually think it starts way before competition. This is like, you can't prepare for, you know, the fight the night before, right? The fight has to be prepared for the months, the weeks, the years prior, right? So the idea is that when we're working with guys or we're talking with guys, a lot of the times, we're trying to uncover and unpack what are all the things that you're doing throughout your life that are impacting and trying to teach them how that's impacting their mindset heading into that game. I see them maybe for two hours a day, maybe five to six days a week. So we're talking 10, 12 hours a week, right? And, and that's, on a high, that's on a high end, right, coach? Like five to six times a week, you're, you're doing it, yes. Yeah, extremely high. So, I mean, even that guy is spending, what, roughly – two full days of time with me, right? 48 hours, 40 hours, somewhere in there, right? So like, it, it, think about that in the grand scheme of a month. It's really nothing. Um, so the idea is we need to create habits and routines throughout our life that allow us to operate within the confines of understanding that if I create these routines and I can make things automated in my life or or move through um, intentional purposes in my life, then all I have to do is trust my process as I'm going along with it and understand that these moments where there are these hurdles uh, are just opportunities to reflect back on how my process is going, what maybe things I need to adjust, but ultimately learn from and then grow. And I know that sounds so vague and it's, and it's hard, but at the end of the day, some of the things that matter more than anything are your capacity to endure. Uh, and then in addition to that is the underlying confidence that you have. And we need to understand that confidence is really just a derivative of how prepared you are and your perspective of your skill set against those you're going to compete against. Um, so Mic drop. Like that's amazing, right? Like we could stop the podcast right there and let people just replay that over and over and over because <laughs> it's just so it's so powerful. And again, it's cliche. Like kids have heard that before, but did it did it sink? Did it set in? Like when you start to talk about routines and habits, habits, those are all amazing, right? Like they can be or they can't be. Again, it's just momentum either working sure. for you or you're against you. And like, I think goals are amazing. I think you should have massive goals, somewhat unbelievable, but be believable enough, right? For you to think you could do it and they should make you uncomfortable, right? But then like, 
you talk about like how do we get there? It's a day by day. It's literally Monday, Tuesday. Th- rinse, repeat. What about setting standards that could help you accomplish your task every day? That over a period of time build the momentum for your goal. How do you talk sure. to your athletes? Like, hey, listen, we need to be really good Monday, and before we can be good on Friday. Mm-hmm. So uh, a couple different ways. So we tend to steer clear of the concept of goal. Uh, simply because of our society's viewpoint of how goals operate, right? We believe we set goals, we accomplish goals. We forget the whole path that needs to lead up to accomplishing that goal, right? So we do it in sort of a way just because it's a pre-notion that people have about setting, you know, smart goals and, and accomplishing these things along this path. A lot of all of those things assume that that path is going to be very linear, and or it at least gives you the notion that it might be linear, right? Um, so the first thing we start off with is, who are you? And we have to get somebody to be aware of who they are at the start. If they're not aware of who they are at the start, there's no point because we don't have a starting point then. We don't have something we can be honest about. Um, that actually takes quite a bit of time because I have to develop a vulnerability-based trust system with this individual, right? They have to fully be vested in me to understand. And the only way they're going to do that is to know that I'm fully vested in them, in getting them to wherever it is they want to be, right? But we haven't even talked about who they want to be yet. We need to figure out who they are. And once we do that and they're honest about it and they can be aware, and we use metrics to do this, right? We have conversations, we have ways and tactics and through verbal and nonverbal communication where we can draw this out of an athlete, but whether it's remote or in-house, but then we start talking about, okay, who do you want to be? Um, and we ask them a very important question then. And we say, okay, this is the person you want to be. How many of your actions throughout your day are a vote for that identity or a vote for the guy that you actually want to be? It, are you acting and completing actions in terms of what you would perceive somebody who is that would be doing on a regular basis. And every time you make choices that go against that identity, you have to be honest with yourself and admit, I have actually taken a step away from that identity. And I haven't done the things I said I wanted to do to be that person. We have three levels of our identity, right? You have your external identity, which is the, your ego, really, the one that you want everybody to believe you are, right? You have your internal one, which is maybe your family knows it, your close friends know it, that is who you actually probably are. And then you have your very deep identity, which potentially not even your spouse is aware of who that is, right? It is, it is very in, innate to inside of you, and it might even be subconscious to you. Our ultimate objective, is to get an athlete's actions to their second level of identity. If they can represent that identity, that is truly who they are embodying, they have taken complete control, not only over their career, but their life. And what this allows them to do is now we can cycle back to the routine and habit formation stuff. Because once we can do this, now they know that in order to create these habits, create these routines, create these patterns in their life, all they have to do is make choices that are going to feed the identity we're talking about. Absolutely, absolutely love that. And I think the biggest thing that keeps coming back to me when I hear you say that is self-awareness. Like know who you are today. Like yesterday is yesterday. Tomorrow is not coming yet. It's not here. So be, look, look at the mirror and just be okay. Like look, measure backwards. Like, so, um, I forget the Dan Sullivan, great author, talks about measuring backwards. Like what you've done in the past is why you're where you are today. And you Mm -hmm. might not like that. That's okay. Like that's a good that you're aware of that. If you don't like where you're at, look what you've done to get you where you're at. And if you don't like it, make adjustments. So I think that's tremendous that you you just get lay out kind of like a a path for these kids to see like, hey, am I really walking the walk, right? Because a lot of kids are really good at talking, right? They, they can talk, especially with, back to your point about Instagram, you know, like, or social media in general. It's easy to post. It's easy to look good. 
But then behind that phone or in front of that phone, that's where it really matters, right? Do your actions align with the the, the billboard you're spreading, the message you're spreading? And yeah, what do you got? So, what do you got? I'm sorry. So I, I you're was good. Say, this society is is very interesting, right? With these kids, and and I get again, I, I always come back to and it, look, I'm hard on my son, but that's because he's my son, right? But like, I give so many of these kids so much credit because they're in a world where you can't really lie. Uh, everything they do, anytime they do it, is tracked. Can they lie, and, or can they? They do you think they could lie, but they'll get caught? Or do you, what do you think? Like they could post I don't, things I don't, that I don't think they can because, and that's why you see a lot of them when you look at their Instagram profile, right? If you pull it up, they have three posts. Why would they have three posts? Because they're concerned about what other people perceive them as, and they like to keep that as in control as possible so their method is just give less if i just give less out there in the world then nobody will really know and then i can maybe do really good at the other end which is also a terrible mentality right but it is the world they're growing up in and it's extremely unfortunate so i think there was this curve where it was really positive and now we're tipping that other end of this i think for a lot of these kids um, the objective should be, they're already very self-aware. They need to put themselves in a situation where, where they're with mentors and, and, and those mentors, by the way, could be cohorts of theirs, right? Could be a teammate, could be whatever. It doesn't necessarily always have to be somebody older or a coach or whatever, but put themselves with mentors that are going to willing, are willing to be honest but in the same breath, make a very powerful statement to them, which is, this is exactly who you are right now. There is no lying about this. This is who you are. But it doesn't have to be who you will be. And it isn't an end game right now. You have an opportunity, just like every day that you are blessed to wake up, to make change to who it is you want to be. And the only thing you can do is make choices that will align with that identity. And when you, man, I, for me, that's so refreshing to hear. Like if I'm an athlete, I'm like, damn, I don't, I don't love where I'm kind of trajectorying right now, but it doesn't have to always be like that. Like I could make adjustments within my day to day to alter where I go next. If I have a clear vision of where I want to go, right? Like inch by inch, step by step. I think that's tremendous. And to surround yourself with like-minded people, and I say like-minded, like in the sense they'll still call you out. Like they'll still give you constructive criticism and push you where you want to go, but they're going to call you out on your BS versus just tell you what you want to hear, right? Because I think we we easily, we've all fall, fallen into that trap before in our lives because it's it's easy, it's comforting. Love that. Um, I wanted to where did I want to go? I had a question to your statement earlier, coach. That I thought, oh, speaking of change, like you also as a coach, right? You're a coach. You're a leader. You have to mm-hmm. walk the walk too. And you just said it uh, a few minutes ago. Your business was completely different three years ago. Something happened out of your control. Coronavirus. Did you could easily just said, ah, you know, we're out. I'm gonna go be a doctor somewhere else. Like that. Ah, it's over. But no, like it, it, you weren't a victim, right? You didn't fall uh, prey to something you couldn't control. You pivoted. You were a man of your word and said, like, listen, I, I love what I'm doing. I just have to pivot here, right? Like I had to do something different because I can't control what's going on. And it happened to work out really well for you. So just to like, you're walking the walk. If you tell your athlete, you're not aligned to what you're saying, you're not, you're also abiding by what you're saying. You're true to your word as well. And I think that's really important to for your athletes to see because they are really intelligent. Like you said, like a lot of coaches like, ah, oh, the new, the modern day athlete, man, they're always questioning everything. I'm like, why wouldn't they? Like, shouldn't shouldn't they? Like, it's it's their journey. I mean, they they, there's never been a generation in the history of the world that has more access to resources, education, knowledge than these guys right here. I mean, uh, seemingly other than athletics, I think you will start to see most normal college routes totally shift in the next 10 years because there'll be absolutely no reason for it because there's way more education already available. It's just their ability to decipher whether that education is right or wrong. And the more exposure they get to both, the better off they'd actually be anyway. 
Yeah, I, th I think, listen, at the end of the day, it's perspective, right? So you can hear bad news and you, you have this natural emotional response to something that goes on bad, right? And depending on how much emotional energy you have in yourself at that moment, then it will undoubtedly show in whatever that emotional response was, right? So like, if I'm having a really stressful day and, you know, uh, for whatever reason, I was late, I was behind, I was, and I get to work and I get bad news that so-and-so had a really bad performance and, you know, their arm is hurting them afterwards. So, okay, if, my, if I have all this emotional energy because I'm stressed, I've been late, I'm this and that. So quickly what could come out of me is, okay, you know, shit, like I'm pissed off now, all of this, right? This anger is a very quick one to come to the surface. So like at the end of the day, your ability to manage your emotional landscape will absolutely aid you in altering the perspective of which you have towards any stimulus or information that's coming at you, right? When you see, uh, I was watching the Yankee game last night and you're watching Garrett Cole pitch, it almost looks like the game is boring him to a certain extent at one point, right? And, it, and he's so unbelievably calm. And I think what you're witnessing is just somebody that has an enormous capacity to control their emotional landscape. And what they're able to actually do is just filter out these moments where they need to pour a lot of emotional energy into something and then others where they need to take a step back and just relax. So at the end of the day, like I said, it's all about perspective. Um, I love that. And I think like, speaking to Garrett Cole, it's like poise. Like he's been there, done that. But also like he has to execute a task a hundred times a game, right? So like th that's a lot of emotional energy to do, physical energy to do. He's choosing to not let it go to a bad arm, to the the other dug like the dugout, the fans. Exactly. Like, that's that's he can't hear it, right? Like so, how do we get a pitcher, a, a hitter, whatever the you the a baseball athlete to understand like everything else is distractions. Know your task, execute, come back out, like take a breath and then come back in, like mentally narrow the focus to execute a task. Cause like as an infielder, there, there is some downtime, like, and it's easy to get lost. Right. But it, it's okay to get lost as long as you understand the situation and you're ready when you need to be ready. Right. Like what are some tasks you use for your, your, your pitchers on the mound to be able to go, you know, in a chaotic situation, focus to narrow their focus and execute a task. Sure. Actually, you, you hit the nail on the head with a little bit of that. And that, and that is, it's a, it's a tactic that I first saw being used in golf. Uh, there's no more downtime than that sport, right? So make a shot, you got to walk or you got to drive to the next shot, right? So you have all this downtime. So it's called narrow and uh, narrow and widen, right? Your focus. But I think it actually starts before the game. And the power of visualization is one of the most impactful things on the planet, right? So every one of our guys, uh, especially in the off season when they're not playing regularly, um, and we start to hit a time where we're going to spend significant time on the mound, uh, has a visualization pen uh, every week. And that visualization pen is 10 minutes where they have to imagine, imagine a part of a game that they are pitching in both positive and both negative scenarios and how they would react in that situation. What's amazing when you see this, and I'm actually super excited now that uh, Whoop has added a stress score to it because we can start to see how well they're actually adapting to visualization through using the Whoop stress score. Uh, and the reason That's is- That's awesome. The human, yeah, the human body has no idea that you are imagining something. The brain is that powerful. Um, so if you can truly practice, and it is a practice, you can truly practice and immerse yourself in a visualization task, you can actually experience physiological events, muscle activation, you can experience heart rate elevation, blood pressure elevation, uh, different hormone secretion. All of these things will actually start to occur because of this visualization tactic that you're doing. So if you've done that, think about the emotional stress that you might experience when that situation pops up 
later that day or later that week. It's not going to have the same magnitude that it originally would have had had you not been prepared or had not felt that. You had just said, uh, Garrett Cole presents poise, been there, done that. Well, it's the same tactic for somebody who's envisioning it. They've been there, done that, right? It's the complex of understanding that if I can expense some of that emotional energy in practice days, hours before, and I can target it at the right spot at the right time, I'm going to be way more apt to do that in game. That stuff like fires me up, right? You think about like Joe Dispenza and some of his work and how people have cured the placebo effect, right? Like literally yep. in between the ears, they cured cancer. Like what, what other vehicle is stronger than the, the human brain, right? And, and, and it's, it's kryptonite. It could be a kryptonite or it could be your hero, right? And again, back to the point you've said eight times, it's under your control, but it's cool to talk about practices to help you garner more control like Garrett Cole does. And obviously, you know, the Kobe Bryant was tremendous at this, right? There's so many interviews of him talking about making the last shot. And he's like, no, I mean, a lot of people think that's my first last. I've been, that's what I practice. Like I've been there mentally before plenty of times. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think back, like in my college career, like, I would always look up fields. Like if I knew I was going to Monmouth University and I hadn't been there yet, I'd go to the website. I'd look at the field because I'd, on, if I didn't, I've never been there. So if I mm-hmm. looked at the field and I was like, oh, natural surface, or kind of, we're obviously going to be on the third base side. All right. I'm, look, I'm looking at the landscape and now I can almost like, all right, it's, it's Wednesday. I'm going into that weekend. I can at least mentally be there a little bit. All right, I know they're going to be gray, yeah. the white, navy, blue. Like I know their jersey colors. So like it's, I think that's, I didn't know I was doing it for any reason other than trying to get mentally prepared or it made me feel comfortable. But now we know more, but there's got to be a lot of like pot. Like, I think more kids need to do that. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, listen, the what's so cool, so cool because these these are kids, right? You're dealing with kids, even when you're dealing with college and then pro guys, right? They're still kids like at the end of the day i mean i'm 37 so to me a 20 year old is still i got 17 years on him i'm almost double his age so like (laughs) to me when talking to these guys you're initially getting some sort of pushback right i'm asking you to close your eyes put headphones on and go through a pen on the mound with no ball and just your glove and initially there's resistance and then all of a sudden, they get done with that first session. And I'll see them later in the gym or something like that. And I'll walk up to them. Hey, how was it? Actually, I really liked it. And I go, how long did it take you to get into that? And he goes, I don't know, about halfway. And then all of a sudden, I let go. And it was great. And I go, can't wait to do it next week, right? And he's like, yeah, actually, I'm, I already know what situation I want to bring up. So it's refreshing, yeah, to see them experience these things that, you know, a lot of times maybe they would resist. And, you know, if if we're just talking about it, it's tough for them to experience it, right? But when they're in an environment that maybe other guys are doing it, maybe guys that are better than them are are doing it religiously, it makes it more acceptable, right? It's kind of weird for a kid at a high school game to, like, close his eyes in the bullpen for 10 minutes. But you know what? If he's striking out the side, inning after inning after inning, people are less questioning that. And they're like, hey, what are you doing? I need to do that. It just became a lot cooler. Um, I think that's so special. And it's like, listen, I get it. There's going to be like, it's not cool at first. Like what? It's it's a little foo-foo. I get it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's why that's why you have trust. Like, listen, have I steered you wrong yet? Like, have I told you something to do something I didn't think was the best practice today? No, try it out. Fully try it out. and Let me know what you think. You hate it. Let me know why, and maybe we're done with it. It's not for you, but try it, right? And I, and I, I think I think that's so amazing, and, I, and it makes me remember at LIU, Coach Dan Perillo, he would have us at the end of practice go through 10 ground balls with no ball. We called them phantom balls, right? And at first, we're like, what? Like, what? You want to say? And it, what it is is, like, you ask kids to go do that, and they don't know what to do. You're like, what do you mm-hmm. mean you don't know what to do? Go feel the ground ball, and they're like, where? What do you mean where? Like you feel that a 30,000 ground ball is in your life, one of them. Like go do it. And then like once they start doing it, it's almost like you look at 
the a map of the United States. At first, there was one road, right? And then there's two, then there's three, then there's a million. It's kind of like that mentally, right? You're creating these neural pathways from in between the ears to the rest of your body, right? And these circuits are starting to fire. And that, I feel like that's what your, your athlete was saying by letting go and letting the circuits communicate with the body, right? And um, I think that's so powerful. And it's, you know, you talk about myelin sheath and like the the wrapping the barn, like the yarn around the ball and creating those those pathways. I love that, Coach. And I think anyone listening, man, you could all do this. And I think you'll benefit tremendously. I'm doing it today on the field because I forgot about it. I love it. Why am I not doing it? Um, okay. We talk a lot about the mental side, Coach. You work with throwers every single day. All right. Let, let's, let's start to move into that realm. Like when you think of throwers, what are some things we have to do really well? Uh, we have to be really athletic. Um, so, uh, it, actually I can just build off of what you were just talking about. So talking about myelin sheets and the, and the fact that like neuromuscularly, right. We have to understand we're doing literally the, the fastest motion the human body can create is, is occurring at the shoulder joint, right? We're asking that to be so precisely accurate that if we're one degree off with where our hand is positioned, that can change one foot of distance that that ball was actually intending to go to. So you are talking about not only the fastest, but the most precise action we could potentially do. And think about how daunting that is, right? So I think where we have come from in what I've watched over the last 15 years in baseball development and training, right? There was this initial wave of long toss is the greatest thing on the planet. Everybody has to long toss, no matter what arm slot you come from, no matter where, how you throw, what it feels like, just do it. Okay, great. And, and don't get me wrong. There's a thousand benefits I could name for long toss. I'm just, you know, chronologically trying to stick this in here. And then it went to like, okay, Hey, we just need to be powerful. We need to lift more. We need to be as strong as humanly possible. Right. And, then it was like, oh, well, no, now we don't understand how to move right. So now we need drill after drill after drill after drill to get us into that position. And then once we figure out that little section of this much larger movement, we'll be better because that little section made it all the way to the big section. Um, and I think, you know, we're drifting a little bit away from that now where I think some more understanding of how actual uh, motor patterning works and uh, motor learning works and the fact that like, hey guys, guess what? You can actually make somebody way worse by giving them a drill, uh, especially if you're asking them to do this same drill over and over. Um, so uh, how do we approach throwing? Um, first and foremost, uh, I wanna understand how somebody moves. So I wanna understand, you know, how do they interact with the ground, right? Because nothing happens if we don't do that. And for anybody that doesn't think that's the case, uh, try and stand on a box, fall and throw in midair where you have no kinetic energy other than gravity pushing you down. Good luck. Or ice skates, coach. Like try and throw the yeah. ball with high intent on ice skates, right? Probably won't work. Right. right. So like it, when, you're, when you're stripping that away, we need to understand first and foremost, how do you interact with the ground? You, you know, are you a guy that wants to look to be in your forefoot and you want to jump? Are you a guy that, you know, and like we would term that in today's world, like they'd be like, oh, that guy's quad heavy or he's quad dominant or he wants to be this. Yeah, but like watch other actions he does. Like how does he run? You know, how does he jump? Are these patterns all being derived by like a massive eversion into this big toe domination? And like, okay, if that's how that guy's going to operate, then he's probably not going to be a hip dominant guy that we want to like move into this huge hinge and, you know, get him into like looking cookie cutter against everybody else. So I, I really just think you have to understand how they interact with the ground. Then you got to try and decide, okay, can, can they create disassociations in their body? Can they sequentially operate? Meaning can they disassociate what's going on at their foot from what's going on at their hip? Can they disassociate the hip from the pelvis? Can they disassociate the pelvis from the torso? Can they disassociate the arms from the torso? Can they disassociate their neck 
from their arms and from their torso, all of these different things. If they can do all those things and just disassociating it is one piece, right? Sure. I, we have plenty of hypermobile guys that come in, which by the way, everybody wants to be like, Oh, I want to be hypermobile. I want to be, they're the worst to work with because <laughs> no, you don't. they're, they're so difficult to work with because yeah. they have such a vast range of capacity that it becomes so difficult for them to control that disassociation and, and coach control. Sorry to yeah. cut you off. I'm sorry. I think that's an important thing. Like let's real quick yeah. on the, on the hyper mobility for everyone listening. If you do a push up right. And your, your elbows, right. You see your elbows start to turn in that, that sure. could be a sign. It's not a, t it's not an exact sign, right? Like, cause there's different joints that show hyper mobile versus others. But just to, for a very general statement, if you do a push up and you go past ranges of motion, or you could do like your, jo your joints go really far coach you, that that's the athlete you're talking about right yeah I'm, I'm talking about a guy that uh when they go to do movement they never really feel limitation so they never really feel an end to a specific Tension. Movement. yeah so if you've ever gone to squat and you're just like hey i squat all the way down my butt hits my back of my heels every time I don't feel any tension in my chest. It actually feels rather comfortable for me to sit down here. Cool. You're probably somewhat hypermobile at the hip joint, right? And you probably have a lot of mobility at the ankle joint as well. Um, does it, defining somebody as hypermobile to me really just means that this joint possesses both ends of its typical range to an extreme amount. So for easiest joint to understand that in is probably the hip specifically because of the fact that it's a ball and socket and there is going to be a limitation to somewhat of the end ranges, right? Internal and external ranges of motion at the hip can create, when you have hypermobility, can create a big issue of creating disassociation, transferring up the chain. Um, guys who won't understand this are guys who have very limited ranges of motion they're like, what do you mean by that? I can disassociate right away, or I've never been able to disassociate my foot from my pelvis ever, so it doesn't matter. Um, and I think here's here the crux of it all is when you're looking at somebody throwing, we have to understand this. We the, For the longest time, we've all been taught throwing is not a natural action. That's why it hurts our arm. That's bullshit. Uh, I can roll a ball at my 18-month-old. He picks it up, throws it right at me. If it wasn't natural, who taught him to do that? And so it's a very natural action. The reason we hurt our arm is because we're in a quest for more kinetic energy. The reason we're in a quest for more kinetic energy, velo wins. It is the king. There's no question about it. It gives you greater success, period, end of story. When we improve mechanics, there is another fact that everybody has wrong. It, improving mechanics means, in, in its essence, you have improved your capacity to transfer energy from the ground to your hand. By nature, that will increase velocity. By nature, that will increase torque and stress at every joint along that path on the way up. Can you improve velocity without adding stress to joints? Yes but it is likely in an athlete that is well-versed and well-experienced already and is likely not changing much of their mass at that point to do that. But the adage that mass equals gas or, you know, I need to throw in one specific way or all these things are our quest, like you said, bringing it all the way back to the beginning to accomplish things at a fast rate, which I commend, but the the quest to have that happen with the human body is difficult um there's it a, just is, there's, it really is yes and i think and, and that's why like i'm very intrigued by your work because of your ability to understand the intrinsic right like to understand the kinetic chain to understand the action reaction of the ground and to understand the sequence that create pathways like the gross the f there's sometimes fine connect uh, affects the gross a lot. And sometimes the mm -hmm. gross you have to un untap, like you have to attack and get the fine motor skills, but everything you said in the beginning about the fastest action 
is that the shoulder, like that's the end effector is the wrist. Like everything you said happens and then it leaves your wrist. So like you have to backtrack there and just see what's going on at the, at the foot, right? Like there's so much, what it, I guess for your pit, like for the pitchers, right? Like, and I trained a lot of pitchers. So I would look, look into this and see like, listen, I can only improve some things in the gym. Like, and I wanted the, the biggest thing that athletes would obsess over is rear hip loading. And, yeah. you know, that's a whole nother podcast coach. Cause there's just, there's <laughs> so much that goes on at that hip and the, uh, the, the femoral joint, but like, there, there are some things like a lot of coaches that like, you have to be a vertical shin only. And I'm like, do you know the human body? Do you know who you're talking to? Because there's a big difference in vertical shin for A and vertical shin for a B athlete, right? Like you got a drop and drive athlete who might get into more dorsiflexion, um, knee valgus, internal rotation quicker. Like some will rip the floor apart, stay in external rotation to hold their glute, quote unquote, like, do you have any where where you at on that? Does so, it make sense? Um, uh, does it make sense that people speak in that way? And we yes. have spoken that way as well. And um, I'm so utterly happy to say we were wrong um, because it just shows growth, right? Uh, we've been wrong, probably uh, slightly less than we've been right, and that's why we're moderately successful, right? But that's like amazing. So, like, at the end, yeah, at the end of the day, though, we've been wrong a ton. And when you're looking, um, my, my answer to that would be, how do you know? How do you know without a definitive doubt that that is exactly how that guy should throw? And maybe the answer is they don't. But to them, that is the best course of action they could provide at that moment. And I would say, is there a force plate underneath them that's telling you the direction of force that this person is applying? And, and, and again, you could you could get all the tech you want in the world, but at the end of the day, back it up. Watch the individual throw. Watch the individual be athletic in a bunch of other things that they do. Watch how they transfer energy. Because at the end of the day, that's all you're watching. All you're watching is how they transfer energy. And the transfer of energy comes from a couple different ways, right? We need to elicit force, right? We need to accept force. And then we need to time in the world of pitching rotation at very specific moments and same thing as infield yeah well any throw any swing anything right it's the timing of these rotational patterns to think that these things are singularly muscular driven is asinine to think that these things are uh you know uh conscious i think is also asinine but there is, a, there is a moment where in a drill, we need them to be conscious. We need the athlete to understand that it needs to alter the blueprint they have in their brain for throwing. And we need to vary as many, once, once you get an athlete to a base point of understanding, right? Of, of how can I manipulate my torso? How can I do so without my lower half? And how can I do it now with my lower half, because those are going to be two totally different things, right? And then when doing so, once I can get them to that base, I want to try and vary their environment as much as humanly possible, because each one of those is going to be a micro blueprint. And if I can start to really clarify a ton of these micro blueprints, all of a sudden, when you bring it back to the main one, which is going to be throwing an object on a mound, towards another small 17 inch white object when i'm doing that all these other little micro blueprints will start to help and shape how that movement has now transformed whereas if i just focus on hey i want to get really good at x drill i want to measure my success at getting good at x drill understand what you're doing you're changing the blueprint that matters the most especially if you don't give back to the main blueprint by getting on the mound and throwing a few after doing so. I, I love that like potentiation of it, like drills build skills, period, right? They should. They, everyone should have a purpose, like you said, for their part in this ever-flowing, insanely fast, beautiful skill, right? And 
I love how you could separate the upper and lower and then bring it all back together and then apply it on a mound. And then there's the the feel of it, right? Like you have to drills create a feel. Once you create a feel, feels real. Feel is just your 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 kinesthetic awareness of a uh, of of a external drill building internal awareness to apply to your task, right? Like I love I, I love all that stuff. Um what else, coach? I think what are some I think drills? It's important. You you just said the kinesthetic awareness, right? And I think it's what's also really important for a lot of coaches, and I think this is much more difficult when you get into working with guys remotely, is understanding what kind of learner you're dealing with, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do, right? You're you're trying to learn a action um, or at least a subset of an action. And you need to understand how best to reach this individual, right? Some some guys are unbelievable at watching video, re-implementing. Other guys are really good at like, hey, let's feel this on a drill. Let me give you feedback. Let me give you some more feedback. Let me back away. And then other guys need to know the process behind the drill. Like, why is this drill being selected? And what is the objective of this drill, right? And they're much more analytical in that approach. So starting to understand that, and I think this is probably the toughest thing. I, look, I've coached high school for 12 years as well, right? Which is probably one of the hardest tasks because you're generally either by yourself or with one other guy with 25 guys and, and not a lot of time. Um, so you need to be able to be the coach that the athlete needs, not make the athlete conform to who you are. Um, and you need to figure out who that person is. And, and at the end of the day, that's our number one. Mission. We're trying to create a relationship and then trying to figure out how to effectively communicate within that relationship with this individual. The better we communicate, we feel, the better we can reach what this athlete needs from us in order for them to take control of their career. Love that, Coach. It just all comes down to communication. I think us as coaches learn as much as we can to communicate the same thing 50 different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. Two days ago, I worked with a, a projected third to fifth rounder, followed up by an eight-year-old. You think mm -hmm. we spoke the same language within those two <laughs> sessions? No, we still talked about infield play, right? We had to still had to catch the ball and throw, but the verbiage, the progressions, the drills are different, right? Um, coach, this has been awesome. I, I, I think there's still so much more to unpack. Want to be respectful of your time. I know you got to go soon, but what do you have going on right now? Do you have like I'm out in San Diego now? Do you have remote stuff? Uh, obviously, after this episode, I think everyone should go follow Velo U, and I think there's a ton of information on there. But what do you have to offer to the remote client or even New Yorkers listening? What do you got going on, and where can they find you? Yeah, well, obviously they can find us at uh, velouniversity.com and then uh, at velou on Instagram or at Velo University, I think it is, on Instagram. I'm, I'm not the Instagram specialist there. So <laughs> our media guy, Kenny, is, a, is the man and he handles it all. Um, but uh, uh, we are actually expanding uh, in-house, so we're doubling in size. Um, Congratulations. So yeah, sort of, right? I mean, it's a, you know, it's a scary moment, but no, it's, it, it honestly, it's because, um, you know, for safety reasons too, like you're throwing objects around, right? And we want to still be able to provide an unbelievable service. So we're, we're standing in house um, and then remotely. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we have a product, like I said, it's going to feel a little different than maybe what you're used to in a typical remote training uh, experience because uh, it's a lot on you. We're asking a lot of feedback. We are talking to you regularly. We're trying to understand what it is you want to accomplish with signing up for this. And, you know, it, it's an application process both ways um, yes. to make sure you're the right fit. And, uh, and I mean that wholeheartedly. Uh, there's plenty of guys we have asked to – you know, try somewhere else or listen, you know, this is, I just don't think this is going to be right. And, and a lot of that tends to boil down to maturity and um, unfortunately sometimes uh, parental input um, and just, that's a whole you know, nother wanting, podcast coach <laughs> wanting their, their kids handheld and, and not understanding how much that's limiting uh, their actual progress. But um, yeah, remote, we handle a ton in-house, we handle a ton. And then um, anytime they have questions, anything like that, um, we have a lot of our 
college and high school guys always answering questions for us on social media uh, because it's way better to have their uh, input than it is to have mine every single time. I'm only one voice. Why should I be the voice sure. that you're listening to? And, and, you know, they're, they're billboards for you as well. You know, you're mentoring them and they're helping mentor the next guy, pay it forward. And uh, I think that's beautiful. I also saw ebooks, right? Like you also have uh, yeah. digital products that people can go check out as well. Yeah. So we have plenty of courses. You can find those all there. Um, and, you know, look, it, none of these things that we're trying to put out there, are we trying to get you to like, even when there's a catchy title on it, I think we have one the other day that was uh, gain three miles an hour in 28 days. Uh, if somebody actually read through that, instead of just looking for like the quick answer, you'd realize, oh, I could be doing all of those things anyway, because it's referencing nutrition and sleep and all the things that you're trying to do outside of the game of baseball and understanding how systemically they will spill back in and make you infinitely better. And I saw that you, you did, you were pretty clear about low hanging fruit and it wasn't, you're not, you're not tricking anybody. It's like stuff you no. should be doing. Here's a reinforcement, a reminder. Yep. Um, coach, you're a stud. I appreciate you for your time. What you're doing is awesome. Oh, I think, think that the baseball world needs more of you, your passion, your knowledge, and uh, you walk the walk. And I appreciate you coming on and look forward to having you back one day. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise. Thank you, coach.